Well, thanks, Tom. And I really need to thank the organizers for the invitation to come speak here today. It sounds like it's going to be quite a session. And I will try to uh, make up a little bit of time here. I know we're behind schedule, but at the very least, I hope we don't put us too much further behind. So as Tom said, my background is mostly in traditional medical schools where the most respected members of the faculty are the guys who have large grants from NIH or maybe from Department of Defense or Centers for Disease Control or things like that. And it's been really interesting for me having come here to Austin, which has a very vibrant biotech community, venture capital community, as you know. And um, I learned a lot from people like this guy. Anybody recognize him? I never met him. I've just read some of his stuff. This is Clayton Christensen, the disruptive innovation guy. And thinking about some of the principles he writes about and applying them to some of the research problems, like why we haven't made much progress in brain injury, it's kind of interesting. So there's basically two types of innovations, right? Sustaining innovation means you take something that's out there and you tweak it and make it a little bit better. So you maybe increase the processing speed on the computer a little bit, you get more miles per gallon out of your engine, you redesign the way your company workflow is organized so maybe you're a little bit more efficient. And that's important stuff. Disruptive innovation is very different. Disruptive innovation starts as something kind of on the margins or on the periphery, the stuff that the, uh, the established powers really don't care about. And pretty soon, all the disruptive innovators wind up becoming mainstream. It's like an overnight success 10 years in the making. So some examples. You know, the internet used to be just a bunch of physics geeks talking to each other. And now, all of a sudden, it's disrupting books and, and TV and news and everyone else. Again, computers. Um, you know, everyone was using mainframe computers not too long ago. And even people at big companies like Hewlett Packard and IBM thought that home computers would never be used by more than just a few people. And now, you know, this thing right here that I'm using to keep time is, a, is basically a computer that we can't live without. Uh, one of my favorites, Southwest Airlines. Right, according to legend, it was conceived in a bar, like. A lot of things are conceived. <laughs> when, uh, when Herb Kelleher and his friends were sitting around envisioning an airline that flew between Dallas, San Antonio, and Houston, and the powers that be at the time didn't even pay him any attention, right? Well, we all know Southwest has become a big success. And meanwhile, I don't think I'll get much from my frequent flyer miles I used to have on Braniff and Piedmont and Eastern and TWA. Uh, steamships, right? Back in the day when steamships were first created, they were kind of puttering around little intracoastal waterways between cities close to each other. The powers that be were dealing with the big sail-powered boats that would go across the ocean because that's where the money was. And again, the disruptive innovators kept tweaking their steamships and kept making them better and better. And now, you know, no one ships goods across the ocean by sailboat. Uh, telephone. You know, we all know when it was first invented, it was basically two soup cans connected by a string, right? And all the money there was telegraph operators that would communicate between New York and San Francisco. And the telegraph guys, you know, Western Union, they didn't pay much attention to the telephone people, and we all know how that one turned out. Uh, medical example, coronary artery disease, right? The cardiac surgeons, you know, the Denton Cooleys and Michael DeBakey's were kings. And they didn't really pay much attention to the endovascular guys, and pretty soon they got disrupted by the endovascular guys. And in turn, the endovascular guys didn't pay too much attention to the pharmaceutical companies who are coming up with statins and other drugs that would decrease the need for coronary artery disease. And now the pharmaceutical guys are disrupting the endovascular guys. So you kind of get the idea how um, really disruptive innovations often start coming out of nowhere. So let's talk about uh, mortality from severe brain injuries I'm talking about. Not too many years ago, it may have been as high as 45%, 50%. And depending which studies you read, it's dropped quite a bit. The 20% is probably some trials that are more selective in, in the patients they enroll. Uh, the real number is probably still you know, 35%, 40%, or maybe even a little bit higher. So how do we get a significant drop like this over the last few decades? The answer is not because of uh, stuff like this. You know, a patient hooked up to some of our studies in an ICU where I used to work, we're monitoring all sorts of great data. You know, this is fascinating and it's fun, but it's been really hard to show that this stuff has made a difference. Instead, it's been stuff like better pre-hospital care. On the bottom left, you see better ICU care. On the right, you see better organization of emergency medical systems, in this case, in the San Diego area. So it's really been the MBAs, the administrative types, who've helped lower the mortality from severe brain injury. It's not so much anything that MDs like, like me have done. This is a standard sort of algorithm I used to use when I was a resident to treat severe brain swelling after brain injury. And uh, that was a long time ago. 
And sad to say, we haven't made a whole lot of progress. I still use the same basic algorithm today. And again, keep in mind, and I'll get back to this towards the end of the talk, we're treating all the patients the same way. You have a severe brain injury, you're getting put into this algorithm. We're not really differentiating very much. There we go. So uh, obviously, all these trials have failed, but not because we've been sitting still. Uh, going back the last uh, three decades or so, there have been at least 33 trials, and there are several ongoing right now, but none of these have really made an impact in terms of reducing mortality or improving outcome from severe brain injury. Now, the, a lot of these were funded by industry, but a lot were funded by you all through the federal government, through NIH. So this is your federal tax dollars. And at the time, everybody was very excited about this. It seemed like a good trial, and, and we had smart people doing this, doing the best they could. Yet there hasn't been a whole lot to show for all this cumulatively. So again, are we just going to repeat the past over and over again? You know, it's interesting. No one can really prove that this quote uh, really came from Einstein, although urban legend attributes, to, uh, attributes it to him, and you can't uh, get away from that. So how can we avoid that trap, and what can we do differently? What have we learned from all this? Well, I'll try to go through seven sort of lessons. And trust me, I had a lot more last night, but I realized I only have half an hour for this talk, so I was deleting slides right and left. So if you were the CEO or the, the head of research for a large drug company, and basically your career depended upon you not doing anything stupid, not wasting millions or hundreds of millions of dollars for your company, you probably want to do your homework, right? Well, that was a point that came out of this review article that uh, is about a dozen years old now, a review from some of the big names in the field about why haven't we made that much progress. And you know, none of this is really rocket science, right? I mean, if you're going to try to study a drug, make sure you know how it works. What's the mechanism of it? Make sure you actually have good preclinical data, stuff like how is the drug absorbed? How quickly is it metabolized? One study uh, lost, uh, one company lost many millions because they didn't know ahead of time that males and females metabolize the drug differently. That would have been good to know. Um, know which subgroup you're studying. So if you're looking at patients with really bad contusions and blood all over their brain, maybe the guys with a concussion probably shouldn't be enrolled in your study, right? They're probably not going to add very much. If you're looking at a drug that's supposed to get to the brain and help nerve cells recover, it would be good to know that it actually gets to the brain before you study it. Clinical management. We'll talk more about this a little bit later, but it is amazing how uh, how much variability there can be. And you guys know the scientific method, right? Ideally, you have an experimental group and a placebo group, and the only thing different between those two is the intervention. And it's pretty hard standardizing clinical management in something as bad as brain injury. Not so difficult if you're looking at, for example, a drug to manage blood pressure. You can do this in a clinic, and you can match patients, and the only thing you're really changing is who gets which drug, or who gets the drug, who gets the sugar pill. But when you've got patients who've been hit by a bus and they've got lines and tubes coming out of everywhere and you're worried about their lungs and their heart and their kidney and their liver and their, their femur fractures, it can get complicated. Know which outcome measures you're going to use. So for example, one large trial was looking at spinal cord injury. If you have a spinal cord injury and you want a drug or a treatment to make you better, what is the most important endpoint you're looking at? What's the most important thing to you? Probably walking. That would be a good one. Maybe controlling your bowel and bladder function, that would be a good one too. Yet the outcome measure for the study was looking at things like um, intelligence quotient and emotional score and social interactions, which are important, but if you're trying to get a drug that's going to help the, the spinal cord rewire itself, those are probably not going to be the things you look at because they're probably going to be the same in the control and experimental patients. Surrogate outcome measures are good things to think about. So the gold standard, right, the holy grail, is to actually improve outcome. But there might be some useful stepping stones along the way. So maybe you can look at um, decreasing the amount by which bruises in the brain enlarge, controlling swelling in the brain, maybe following a marker in the blood. You know, some kind of surrogate outcome measures would have been good things to identify and track along the way. Statistics we'll talk about, but it's amazing. You think about that slide of Einstein, how we've kept doing the same thing over and over in all these studies. And only recently have people said, you know, there is a better way to do this. Consent issues, this is crucial because the most important part of any clinical research is that patients have the right to refuse, right? We don't force anyone into a research study. Yet what do you do if you have an extremely time-sensitive condition like stroke, 
like brain injury, like a heart attack, like someone who's been badly injured in the trauma, it's two o'clock on Sunday morning, you need to do something right now. And you don't have the luxury maybe of waiting to find family who may be many states away, you may not even have family identification. So you need to balance some of those issues. And finally, study management. I mean, if, if you are the principal investigator for a large clinical trial, like um, we're participating in one that's being run out of Emory University in Atlanta to look at progesterone and brain injury, the PI for that works about 60 to 80 hours a week on that trial. And he's already a doctor with a full-time job. So it's worse than starting your own business. You know, every time a patient gets enrolled anywhere around the country, he's involved, he's troubleshooting. So it really becomes a, a labor of love. And the idea about having someone that dedicated and a team of coordinators and personnel underneath them is, uh, is not something to be taken lightly. Now, I constructed this slide, this slide like this on purpose. You know, lots of small print. There are a lot of issues there. We could have listed more. But I think you get the idea that um, uh, clinical trials are hard to do. So that may explain at least part of the, the failure of all the TBI trials. Lesson two, so when, when you're reviewing a grant, a standard part of this is the, the guy submitting the grant always need to prove that, yeah, we can meet these enrollment goals. You know, and they estimate based on their performance in other studies or based on the number of patients they see that we'll enroll X number of patients per month at each site and look at all the sites and they, it always sounds great. It almost always fails. You know, so many of these trials, at least in brain injury, are way behind on their enrollment and recruitment rates. And there have been some interesting innovations at NIH designed to do that. One is this thing called the NET, Neurological Emergency Treatment Trials Network. The idea is that there's a standing network ready of, of high volume emergency care sites for neurological conditions. So you can come up with any trial you want, whether you're looking at stroke or brain injury or spinal cord injury or epilepsy or, or what have you. And there's this network that can help you enroll patients. Um, we are in the midst of applying to try to become uh, one of the hubs. So what you see here are 17 hubs around the country, and each hub with a spokes radiating out from it. Um, and by the way, I should have mentioned that um, what I'm trying to do here is also focus a lot of attention on how Austin is in the middle of a lot of these things, what we're doing right here locally to try to get involved in some of this and driving some of this, sort of playing off Senator Watson's theme earlier. That's why the burnt orange background on the slides is not an accident. <laughs> um, it's just interesting quickly to tell you how uh, East Coast centric some of these folks can be because when we applied, um, one comment was, you know, Austin and Houston are close to each other. Why do you need two hubs in Texas? And you say, well, look, you got two right there at Stanford and San Francisco. You've got two in Philadelphia. You've got three in Southeastern Michigan. And they don't realize that there's a lot of space between Austin and Houston, but they've been educated. Lesson three, smaller trials. So um, the way this usually works, or traditionally, you start with something called a phase one trial, where you're just trying to get basic information about a drug. You know, what's the maximum dose you can tolerate before you start getting side effects at limited dose? Is it safe? How is it metabolized and absorbed? Things like that. And once you've, you've got that down, you tend to go to slightly larger trials to look at some sort of signal of efficacy, like does this really you know, lower swelling in the brain or improve blood flow in the brain, whatever you're looking at. And then once it looks like things are still good, then you jump to the major leagues, right? Then you start spending 10, 20, 30 million dollars on a huge trial. And that's why there's this graduated process, because you all are paying for these trials with your tax dollars, and I think you want the people who review these grants to be a little bit prudent in doing this. Well, there's been this tendency, though, to try to swing for the fences and try to play long ball, and maybe we should focus more on just playing small ball and go for singles and maybe doubles. And that's what they're doing at NIH, to try to broaden that portfolio and be a little more selective about the larger trials. So this phase one, phase two, phase three categorization is a little bit artificial, but you get the idea that there should be this gradual process going from an idea all the way to a huge trial. All right, intercenter variability. And this gets to the issue about how, uh, how doctors can be so hard to manage. We, we think we're right, and we hate to admit that there may be a better way to do this. Oh, can you go back one slide, Kerry? Can I do that? Um, I heard this great talk not too many years ago from this thing called the Hydrocephalus Clinical Research Network. You know, that's a condition, where, especially in, in children, and pediatric neurosurgeons see a lot of this, where there's too much spinal fluid building up in the brain. And it basically started with a wealthy family who had a child with this who ponied up some money to try to create this research network. And they enlisted five of the largest pediatric hospitals in North America to participate. 
and they have different parts of this group, but one thing they're looking at is trying to decrease infections from a shunt operation to try to fix this. And what they did is they basically decided, okay, let's start from the beginning, you know, and come up with a standardized protocol. So every patient's going to take some sort of FISA hex shampoo shower the night before. Um, there's a standardized way we're going to prep the skin. Um, standardized way we're going to drape things out. Now, they didn't really mention too much about the, the surgical technique itself, but then afterwards, are we going to staple or suture the skin? What kind of dressing do we put on? Do we give antibiotics after the surgery? How long do we leave the dressing on? You know, all the stuff was specified. You gather data on a couple of hundred patients, you look at your baseline rate, then you tweak something. You say, okay, we're going to try something a little bit different and see if the infection rate goes up or down. Do that for a few hundred more patients and see. Now, this is common sense. This is the way Toyota makes its cars. This is the way any good company does stuff. Why can't neurosurgeons do that? And they say the hardest part of this whole thing was getting all these pediatric neurosurgeons in a room and agreeing to be part of the trial. Some agreed, some had to be bludgeoned in a submission, but you know, once you actually get over that hurdle, it's a lot easier to do this stuff. And this whole problem of getting centers at uh, different hospitals to do things the same way can sink many trials. Okay, standardized data sets. So right now, if I get a huge grant from the government, you know, a five-year study to enroll a, a thousand patients, I'm going to spend the first few months, maybe the first six months or longer, coming up with my data collection forms. You know, so in other words, you want to get um, something like <coughs> date of birth. Well, do you do a month, day, year, year, day, month? Do you do a two-digit or four-digit year? What, what software program do you use? All these details. And then if my buddy at another institution gets the same grant, he goes through the same thing. We're reinventing the wheel every time, right? We're wasting a lot of time and money doing stuff that, that should be a, a, a one-off. Then at the end of all this, you're supposed to dump all your data into a database because now the federal government wants you to make this data available. Well, again, depending upon the format you use, you may be dumping in stuff that's basically, you know, English and Chinese and Russian and Arabic, and you can't talk to each other. So there's been a lot of recognition about that to try to come up with common data elements for neurological diseases. So I'm involved heading one of the subcommittees for the traumatic brain injury group. Dr. Warwick is involved with the stroke group. Um, just had a conference call about this day before yesterday. So the idea that there'll be something off the shelf. So when I get my grant funded on Monday, then Monday night I can download this and start creating my forms, modify them a little bit, and we're good to go. Um, again, this is an example of a basic sort of form uh, looking at vital signs and um, the airway breathing circulation status. You can make this a little more complicated if you want. You know, this is a sort of existing version. This will become obsolete in a couple of months. Uh, FITBER, Federal Interagency Traumatic Brain Injury Research Database, uh, put together by NIH Department of Defense. It's going to put all the stuff available in a large database. So as of, I think, um, yesterday afternoon or today, the public comment period for our common data elements for brain injury became available. You have six weeks if you want to log on and say, yeah, you like it, no, you hate it. End of June, that comment period closes, and then the Fitber guys are going to try to uh, transform that into their database, which is set to go on July 16th. So again, the idea that we'll all be putting our data into one database and we'll be able to talk to each other afterwards, because it really becomes like the, the Google approach, right? This is a cover of The Economist not too long ago. It's really easy to get data. It's really hard to analyze it and make sense of it. And if you don't believe me, go on rounds with medical students and interns nowadays. They write progress notes that are 10 pages long, where everything is written in tremendous detail, and they have no idea how the patient's doing. Okay, so I think the age of documentation is over. We need to start interpreting and analyzing better. This is a sort of interesting slide. Um, it, some of us call it the cone of death, but the guy who came up with this calls it the cone of life. The idea is that if you follow a completely horizontal line, that's the median. And on the left-hand side, you have mild brain injury, where things are a little bit off from median. And then moderate, they're more off. And severe TBI, things are really screwed up. And imagine if you can take a cross-section of that, hypothetically. So if you look on the bottom right, see that white circle. Maybe that's where the norm is supposed to be. And uh, I don't know why the thing is colored green. It's just for effect. But maybe those red arrows are things like um, patient's neurological exam and CT scan appearance. You know, he's pretty screwed up on those. But as you go around, he may be okay in things like his age, associated injuries, his hemodynamic status. So you get the idea that maybe a quick visual representation can help you synthesize a lot of information all at once. This is already being done for things like tumor morphology, tumor studies, but not so much for clinical trials. 
Okay, so I'm going to give you a very quick statistical lesson here, and I wish the senator were here because the way to frame this or tee this up is to go back to politics. <laughs> so people talk about the 40% the rule of politics in this country. So no matter what happens between now and November, Obama's going to get at least 40% of the vote, right? They're going to vote Democratic. And Romney's going to get at least 40% of the vote because 40% are going to vote Republican. So they're really fighting for that 20% in the middle, right? They're the group that can make you or break you politically. So how does that apply to what I'm talking about? On the left is something called the Glasgow Coma Scale, which is a, a classic way about how we score the severity of brain injury. So a lower score is pretty bad. And in general, three to eight on the bottom there are your severe brain injuries. Three being someone who's close to death, eight, relatively speaking, not as badly off. And then as you go higher, you get to moderates and severes. The way we scored outcome is something called the Glasgow Outcome Scale, where one, obviously death, two, you're in a coma forever, three, you can interact a little bit, but you depend upon others for, for daily care, four, you can actually maybe go out and work independently and use public transportation, but maybe work in a supervised setting, and five is a good recovery. So you have this five-point Glasgow Outcome Scale, which you basically break down into good or bad. It's called a dichotomized scale, right? Dichotomy means you break it into two right there. So what you do is you, you conduct your study, you get like 1,000 patients in there, and let's just say that you, you predict that your placebo group will have about 50% bad outcomes and your study group will have only 40% bad outcomes. You're looking for a 10% difference. You just lump all your patients in and, and see what happens. Well, let's think about that a little bit more intelligently. If you have a Glasgow Coma Scale score of eight, you should probably have a pretty good outcome from that, believe it or not. Okay, so maybe in that case, four is a bad outcome. Likewise, if you come in with a GCS score of three, you have a good chance of dying. So in your case, maybe a severe disability is a good outcome. So this sort of approach is called a sliding dichotomy where you kind of shift the expectations based upon how severely injured people are. And that makes a lot more sense. Now, Next couple of slides, I don't have time to get into them, but there's also something called proportional odds, where if you look at this, why do you have a five-point scale, but we're breaking it down into just good or bad? You know, why do we look at the total shift in outcomes across all five points of that? And that's essentially what proportional odds does. So it's a way to maybe get a little more efficiency in your study. You're able to uh, get more data for less time, and you see on the right-hand side, that's a big pile of money. That's your taxpayer's money. So we're trying to be better stewards of that. Last thing, and this is, in my opinion, this is probably the biggest reason why all these studies have failed. So let's imagine that um, somebody in your family, your you know, husband, wife, mother, father, is unfortunate enough to suddenly develop severe crushing chest pain that's running down their arm, going up to their chin, and they're sweating and they're breathing hard, and they don't feel very good at all. You take them to the emergency room, and a the doctor there treats them with what? Antibiotics. Because imagine we live in a world where somebody figured out a long time ago that chest pain is sometimes caused by pneumonia like this. Now, in this imaginary world, they haven't figured out that sometimes chest pain is caused by a collapsed lung, by a heart attack, by pneumonia, by an upset stomach, by a broken rib. It's just that a few patients got better to give antibiotics, so that's what we do with all of them. And that's really what we're doing with brain injury, right? So these are six patients who all have the same Glasgow Coma Scale score. They're all comatose. So by current standards, they'll all be enrolled in the same study. These are six very different diseases. Okay, the top left is an epidural hematoma. You get that guy out of the OR quickly enough, he'll go home in a couple of days and be fine. Uh, the bottom left is a bad acute subdural hematoma. That's going to be a big, ang big angry swollen brain, just like the one in the middle on the top. That guy needs an operation too. Uh, look at the top right, that's diffuse axonal injury. Probably doesn't need much in the way of sophisticated neuromonitoring there. And the bottom right is an angry, swollen brain that um, it doesn't need surgery, but that guy's going to be pretty sick. So wouldn't it make sense to treat each of these differently? I mean, let's go back to when the Glasgow Coma Scale when it was first published in 1974, okay, by this fella, Graham Teasdale, who went on to have a very good career. He became... Um, President of the Royal College of Surgeons, Editor-in-Chief for the European Journal of Neurosurgery. He became a knight, so we call him Sir Graham right now. Now, Glasgow Coma Scale is one of his first publications, believe it or not, as a junior faculty member. Um, so that was published in 74. In the late 70s, that led to something called the Traumatic Coma Data Bank, which was a collaboration of four med schools in this country, uh, UC San Diego, UTMB, 
UVA and Medical College of Virginia. And all they did was gather data on this, this crazy new technique called CT scanning to see how that related to brain injury, measuring pressure in the brain, using these new tools called the Glasgow Coma Scale, Glasgow Outcome Scale. And the results of that have been driving our treatment ever since. So essentially, um, you know, we're going back to 1974. Now for those of you who don't remember 1974, that was the Academy Award winner, The Godfather. The UPC code was used for the first time to sell a pack of gum in Troy, Ohio. Ali stunned the sports world by uh, beating Foreman in a rumble in the jungle. You had All in a Family as your most popular TV show. Lucy was first discovered and fashion was at an all time low. <laughs> if, um, <laughs> if you have diabetes or hypertension or asthma or high cholesterol and you're being treated the same way you were treated in 1974, you're probably not getting the best treatment. Yet that's what we're doing for brain injury right now. Um, you know, cancer, I mean, look at what we've done with that. You know, it's quite, sort of like saying you have cancer and that's it. Well, okay, a little bit better is to say is it lung, prostate, colon, breast. And now they're breaking it down by anatomy, physiology, genotype. And, and again, we're still kind of plodding along in 1974 when it comes to brain injury. So I've done a lot of whining so far. So what are you going to do about it? Well, remember that slide I showed about the data? And believe it or not, your federal tax dollars in the USA paid for a group of very productive people in Europe and um, in Belgium and the Netherlands to take data from 11 big trials funded by industry and NIH and just try to look at outcomes. And the first stumbling block they realized is it took about 15 person years to get all this data in the same database, get them to, to talk to each other. And that, um, actually I was on the external advisory board for that, so we just had our final meeting a couple of months ago. Um, so top left, that, that's what you do. It sounds really exotic to say you fly to Europe for a meeting and really you sleep on a plane, sit around a conference table for a couple of days, then go back and sleep on the plane on your way home. Um, the bottom right, you can see the guy in the front row on the left, that's Sir Graham. This was his last official action. You know, he's retired and he sort of wound up the study and he's gone. Um, and uh, as the lone or one of the few Americans, I'm hiding way in the back there on the right side. Mm -hmm. And as you might expect, the guy in the front, all the way in the right, the best dressed guy in the room, he's from Milan. <laughs> um, what that led, and there's a lot of abbreviations here, but this whole idea as the study was going on, we participated in um, ERA's America, American Reinvestment Recovery Act grant to basically do what we call a traumatic coma data bank for the 21st century. Although instead of just severe brain injuries, you were looking at everyone. Um, certainly, as you all know, mild brain injury, concussion has gotten a lot of press lately from pro sports, from the wars in the Middle East. So we're not only looking at the whole spectrum, we're also looking at MRI, because no one's really done some, some decent work on that in brain injury. And we're collecting blood specimens, too, because we actually don't have a serum marker for brain injury, even though we have it for heart attack and many types of cancer. Again, brief slide here, but you can see, um, the instance of mild brain injury, and most of those 1.5 million brain injuries a year are mild, and that number's actually gone up since this slide was put together. So this, these are the participating centers. On the left, UCSF, uh, Austin's in the middle, Pittsburgh, and Sinai. Now, just to put this in perspective, uh, UCSF is the number one ranked neurosurgery department for NIH funding in this country. Pittsburgh is number two. Uh, Sinai is a rehab place, and they do well too. But right away, we're running with the big dogs, right? The, the most impressive neurosurgical research departments of some of the best medical schools in the country were right there. And we actually pulled this off with, again, a very interesting private partnership working with the group called HPCR, Hospital Physicians for Clinical Research, who are sort of a for-profit research group that works with our emergency medicine group here, ESP, and some of them are in the back. So it's been a great combination of um, you know, federal dollars working with med schools and a private hospital and, and all this. And very quickly, just to show you an example of a paper that uh, we have submitted, the idea that you have a concussion, you have a negative CT scan, yet you get an MRI scan, how likely is that to show something? And the answer is pretty likely. On the left, you see that um, patients had a normal CT, had a normal MRI 75% of the time, but about a quarter of the time had an abnormal MRI. Those folks are more likely to have problems on neuropsych testing three months out because part of this is looking at neuropsychological tests. So the question, okay, does that mean anything? And the answer is, yeah. If you can target those folks, maybe you can start intervening so that they won't lose their jobs, drop out of school, get divorced, get arrested, or get involved with drugs in those few months. So um, as I said, it's been submitted to um, a journal. We'll see what the reviewers have to say about that. 
Uh, finally, stratifying by subtype of TBI. Now, this slide proves the point that the way to lose an audience is throw up a slide with a big table full of numbers and things like that. So I'll try to summarize here. Um, look at the second line, which says percent poor outcomes. And, and this is data based on NABISH. NABISH sounds like something you buy in a Jewish delicatessen in New York City, but it actually stands for National Acute Brain Injury Study Hypothermia. Some of the big hypothermia trials that were done out of UT Houston and Herman. The bottom line is that if you came in with a normal temperature, um, you know, you're, you're not cold, so say you get injured in Austin in July, and it doesn't really matter whether you get randomized to H, the hypothermia group, and the normothermia group, your outcomes are about the same. If you get injured in Minnesota in January and you come in cold and you get randomized to the group you're supposed to get warmed up, so first thing you do is throw warming blankets on you, you have a 94% bad outcome, twice as high as, as the other groups. That's pretty high. NABISH-2 was a, a study where we were actually cooling people off in the helicopter, I mean, as soon as the paramedics scooped them up. And uh, again, if you got randomized to the hyperthermia group, only 33% bad outcome. You know, twice as high in the uh, normothermia group, but small numbers, and uh, that's been submitted for also for review. The point is that these are only the patients with hematomas, only the patients who had an operation. So next time you design a hyperthermia and brain injury trial, you may not want to include all those folks who just have a diffuse injury, don't need an operation. You want to focus on these guys right here. And um, we're kind of stumbling along building some collaborations, but that's, uh, that's something we're looking into. So getting back to our friend Clayton Christensen, uh, what are some of the lessons that you know, we've learned from him in terms of applying some of his principles to brain injury research? Um, just to summarize what I talked about here, uh, do your homework if you're going to plan a trial. You know, actually make sure there's some laboratory evidence to support this. You really want to think about how to design and execute your trials better. You want to maybe focus on smaller trials that are more like proof of principle trials instead of trying to hit a home run every time. You really got to get your doctors in line to uh, manage the intercenter variability. The idea about databases, feeding things, um, you know, not just your study, but be, being able to study thousands of patients, because again, that's how Google makes its money. That's how a lot of these companies make money now. Uh, do a better job with statistics. You know, just because we've done it one way for 25 years doesn't mean we can't change. And recognize that traumatic brain injury is not just one disease. And I think targeting those different subtypes is going to be the way to go in the future. So again, echoing what the, what the senator said, we have, have this unique sort of weirdly Austin way of doing things here, combining with the med school and the community and the private hospital and private industry to, to really try to make some head roads in this area. So thank you very much. I think I went a few minutes too long.